Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our speaker this morning comes to us from Chicago, Illinois. Charles Adler is a social entrepreneur, co-founder, and former head of design at Kickstarter, the groundbreaking crowdfunding website. As a leading entrepreneur and designer, his work ranges from systems design to interaction and communications design, interface design, and information architecture. Charles co-founded Kickstarter in 2009 and shaped it into the world's largest marketplace dedicated to funding independent creative endeavors. Since its inception, Kickstarter has raised over a billion dollars uh, from more than 6.4 million people for 64,000 successful projects ranging from computer games to music albums, technology, fashion, educational projects, even full-length feature films. <clears throat> As the Kickstarter phenomenon continues to grow and find an ever-expanding user base, Mr. Adler has been widely recognized as one of the digital era's most exciting innovators. In 2013, he was named as one of Forbes magazine's 12 most disruptive figures in business. Charles Adler previously co-founded the online art publication Subsistence, a platform dedicated to leveraging the web to provide global exposure to the work of independent artists. He also co-founded Source ID, where he operated as principal creative director for five years. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Charles Adler. Thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. Cool. Um, so you guys get credit for being here? Is that right? Is that right? So yeah, did somebody say no? Some people get credit, I'm sorry, it's uneven. Uh, I was told, I'm just the messenger, um, I'm gonna share something with you guys. I hope this is okay. Um, well, it's okay, because I have the mic. Um, so I find that profound, because in a way, am I a professor for like the next 30 minutes to 60 minutes? Yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. I'm also a college dropout, I dropped out three times. Uh, so I tried three times, I, I dropped out three times, I, I joked that I kind of beat them to the punch before they kicked me out. So it's sort of crazy to think that I'm sitting here teaching anybody anything, um, but let's have fun with that. Um, so uh, I think, you know, kind of go, digging into the, the introduction, blah, 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 um, these words on the screen, I want to share a little bit about me. Um, and hopefully this relates to, to many of you or some of you. Um, I'm not just a designer. I'm not just an engineer. I went to school. I went to Purdue. Okay. Uh, I went to Purdue. There's applause in the audience. That's cool. Okay. I thought I was going to get like tomatoes thrown at me. Uh, so um, I went to Purdue, uh, studied engineering. I really wanted to be an architect as a kid. Um, it's a argument story between me and my father I won't get into. Um, and somewhere along the way I found design. Uh, I was also fascinated with technology. Um, and then there's this third word up there, entrepreneur, um, which I kind of struggle with because I never grew up as a kid having a lemonade stand, thinking about starting a business. Like that was not my vision of the future. Frankly, I wanted to be a DJ or a drummer uh, in a punk rock band. Um, so like business person, like hell no. Um, but I stumbled into these things. I sort of accidentally became these things, and I am a little bit of all of these things. Um, which is to say, I think you know, many of us, like we're here in a business school, maybe you go out and start a business, um, maybe you don't, maybe you become an artist at some point in your life, maybe you are an artist now, and I think many of us are many different things. We just get funneled into one thing because we're supposed to make a, a life for ourselves. So that's maybe a little bit of, of, a, of an introduction. Um, maybe we can talk about that and unpack a little bit of that later. Um, what I want to talk about today, there's sort of like three chapters to this story that I'm going to share, or three stories I'm going to share. Um, one, egotistically, is about my life. That is more, less about ego and more about context. Um, where did I come from? What kind of uh, drove me in life uh, that then eventually led to Kickstarter, right? And so this is the story of like, where did Kickstarter come from? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about Kickstarter. 
uh, and the stories that kind of came about through Kickstarter and what that meant for us and, and how we see the future going. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about this new project that I'm working on. Um, so uh, as a creative person, as a designer, um, as a technologist, like what an awesome time to live in. Right? Like the world is totally changing. Like the world out there is like totally, totally changing. Um, every minute someone's launching some new app. Maybe you guys are launching apps. Anybody got a computer open? Somebody launching an app, doing a git commit? Um, I'm launching an app right now. And, um, and so like there's this really crazy moment of play. And it's that future kind of driven by that creativity, that ambition, uh, that sort of rethinking the world that I get really excited about. And so if I kind of go back to that um, definition of Charles for a minute, which is to say uh, I'm a generalist. Um, a generalist is a sort of confluence of many different things, disciplines. Um, the question I kind of pose when I look at an image like this is, is this art or is this technology? Is this a startup? Is this some app that we're going to end up playing with? Is this some autonomous vehicle that's going to go you know, fly up and carry our packages? Uh, and arguably, the person who was making this. Um, this was in a space that I had uh, prototyped a couple of years ago in Chicago. Uh, the person who was making this probably didn't even know the answer to that themselves. This was just a creative project, something very innocent. They were playing with um, putting wires to a computer, to an LED screen, to make something and see what happens, right? Um, and so there's an innocence to this. I think there's also, as much as we're fascinated with technology and all of the things that come uh, come with that, the reality is like you guys are sitting in old technology chairs, right? Like I don't think I don't think we're getting rid of our butts and I don't think we're gonna ever get rid of chairs. Now maybe we might embed uh, technology into chairs. Um, it quite, quite frankly seems a little absurdist to me, but maybe, maybe I don't I can't predict that future, but we will always still make things with our hands, right? And so there's a little bit of this counterpoint, which is, um, you know, are we all going to be out of jobs in, in, in some future? Is it all, we're all going to be taken over by the, the AI robot? Um, and I don't think that future is, is going to look the way it does in, in sci-fi films, or at least not entirely. Um, anybody uh, big fans of Blade Runner? Right? Like, I don't think we're ever going to get to Blade Runner, I hope. Um, it might look something like that, but maybe not quite as dark. Um, so I'm really inspired by this, this future, and I think the, the thing that I'm most inspired by in terms of that future, and this kind of per pertains very much to a lot of my work, um, specifically with Kickstarter, is it's a future that empowers every one of us to participate in defining that future, and it's a future that allows us to do what we want the way we want to do it, right? Um, we don't have to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an entrepreneur for that matter. We can go and be an artist and make a living, right? We can do the thing that inspires us and, and live the best life that we can. That is the future that I'm most excited about, and that is the narrative um, in terms of leveraging technology that I want to see happen. Um, so um, something else I didn't share about myself is I'm also uh, a bit of a history nerd. I'm trying to always figure out how did we get to where we are, right? Uh, and how do we paint a path for a future that sometimes looks a little bit different than the past, um, but also how do we learn from the patterns of, of history? So um, without talking about history, I think we'd be lost in, in moving into the, into the future, so I'd be a bit remiss if we didn't dig into that history. Um, and so this is that ego history I was talking about. Um, so as a kid, I grew up in Connecticut. I was born in London, grew up in Connecticut, um, and uh, at some point in my life came out here to the Midwest. Um, but as a kid, I, you know, a pretty shy, pretty shy person, um, was usually in the back of the class, not in the front of the class, and uh, maybe in, in sort of antithesis to the introduction and the whole disruptor moniker, I wasn't the kid throwing chewing gum at the teacher, paper airplanes, like I was pretty quiet. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was also interested in or just gravitated towards this subculture or subcultures, right? One now I think dubs uh, sort of the outsider art movement. Um, outsider art is uh, effectively a group of people who are artists that didn't go to school for art, 
so they're outside of the system. Uh, punk rock, electronic dance music, industrial music, skateboarding, all the things, right, back in the 70s and 80s, so I'm, I'm a little old. Um, in the 70s and 80s, um, I was somehow attracted to this, right? Um, I think part of it was the passion of perseverance, the fact that these were people that were fighting for something, that stood for something, and whatever. I was a teen, maybe it was just this sort of like raucous energy. Um, and there was this mantra, uh, whether specific or made up in my own head, uh, that I was also attracted to. And I think this comes from um, our youth and our teens where we're trying to self-identify or discover ourselves, um, but also challenge some status quo, challenge our parents, challenge our teachers, challenge the past. Uh, and that was this sort of rallying cry that the, the rules were meant to be broken, right? So like really aggressive, maybe disruptive, I guess, um, but really just trying to find a voice, right? Like, don't tell me what I can't do, right? Right? Yes, okay, cool, awesome, I like enthusiasm. Uh, and so like this, this drove me, this is what I was attracted to. And years and years, decades later, when I um, uh, moved to New York and met my would-be co-founders, Perry and Yancey, we realized like this was a common trait, right? So we're sort of a, always attracted to folks that are um, like us, fortunately or unfortunately. So I want to talk a little bit about the things that we were fighting against, and that was both us as three individuals, as founders, as technologists, so to speak, um, but I think more broadly, culturally, right, in this, in this sort of like these communities that we were um, each a part of, right? We all came from um, some form of an arts community, whether it was music or film or writing or, or, or otherwise. Um, and so I think as, a, as somebody who was fascinated with history and technology, you have to go back, like, let, let's look at the Midwest and look, look at Detroit and look at Ford, right? Uh, fascination with uh, the industrialization of business to produce more and, and, and grow more, which leads to this sort of consumerist behavior. And um, effectively, like, looking at that, we became obsessed culturally, universally, globally, uh, with applying those sort of methods uh, to everything. Right? We have effectively industrialized every part of our lives at this point. Right? And it sounds very um, maybe trippy or hippy-dippy, but I think it's, there's a lot of truth in this. And carrying that story forward, um, anybody uh, old enough to remember Laverne and Shirley? Right? So like, thank you, Tumblr. Anybody know Tumblr? A right? couple people know Tumblr. Like, so thank you, Tumblr, for allowing me to find this image and my age to, to remind me of Laverne and Shirley. But we've industrialized like, the places that we work. Right. Doesn't seem like a very passionate place to work. To spend eight to 10 hours standing there just moving things down a, uh, a, a conveyor belt. Like, I'm sorry, that looks like it sucks. Um, and so, you know, we, we've industrialized people, right, right? I mean, effectively, they're doing jobs that machines could do or should do, uh, maybe now can do. Um, and then as a designer, so I, I, um, I mentioned I dropped out of, uh, out of school and uh, I, my professional title, like literally on my business card, was webmaster. Anybody? Anybody? Like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like, so in the, in the early 90s, um, there was this kind of generalist term called the webmaster. Like, you programmed and you built websites. And so that was my job back in uh, 1994, 1995. Um, and eventually got uh, the small little company that I worked for in Chicago, we got acquired by a much bigger company. Um, and uh, again, Tumblr, thank you, awesome animated GIFs. Uh, decades later, I find this image on, on, on Tumblr and I realize, oh my God, I'm that stupid little kitten with the headset on. I'm just this like plebe in this other big machine, right? So we industrialized, in some way you could argue we industrialized art. I think we very much have industrialized art. Um, but I became part of that system. I didn't like it. Um, and so I up and, up and quit. Um, but effectively, what I wanted to kind of give you this backstory what, for was we were all trying to fight against this stuff. Um, so I'll give it a, a, a picture um, through um, a film uh, that I, I find kind of entertaining. Well, it is entertaining, uh, but the, how I'm gonna talk about this is also, I think, abstractly entertaining. So anybody remember a, a film from the 90s called Die Hard? Yep, everybody raise their hand. Everybody should raise their hand. All right, uh, so Die Hard, awesome movie, like entertaining, Bruce Willis, like cray cray. Um, and it was a hit, 
right? This is, this is a sort of commentary about the industrializ industrialization of everything. Now, it's hard to say that like Die Hard was an um, artistic film, um, but there was something creative about it for sure, right? It was entertaining. Um, well, it was a hit. It was a box office, box office success. And so what did industry do? Rinse and repeat, same thing. How many diehards have there been? Six, I don't know, five, a lot. Um, and so we get, kept getting fed the same story over and over again. Um, let's go a decade later, right? Um, anybody, can anybody predict the film series that I'm gonna mention that's kinda like a modern, what? Oh, interesting, uh, that, not Avengers. Um, but that whole thing is interesting, like, Marvel Comics and DC Comics and kind of pulling all that history up. No, um, the Born Identity, the whole Born series. Oh my God, like it's kind of Bruce Willis, but it's a different dude. And maybe it's better and maybe it's more realistic, frankly, um, but it's kind of the same story. So we just got fed the same thing. They gave us a gap and we got fed the same thing. And I'm sure there's other examples of that. Um, so it was this rinse and repeat. And what the results that that represents is there's all these the litter of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people doing different stories, pushing the boundaries of filmmaking, pushing the boundaries of storytelling, and there's no room for them, right? And that depressed us, that frustrated us, because as three people that were part of culture and uh, the subculture of people that were um, effectively couldn't get their projects out there, whether it was a film or a book or, a, or an album uh, or even get into a gallery, it was really disappointing to us, right? And we felt that their voice should be heard. So enter Kickstarter. Um, what's interesting, uh, the, the theme of this, this series is what, 10 years Hence, so there's um, a poeticness to this in that we literally launched 10 years ago uh, on the 28th of April. Where are we, at the 12th of April? So it's like, oh my God, super close. I should have been here on the 28th. Uh, and so there's like this poetic justice to this whole thing. Yeah, which is what? That's just Sunday. What do you guys do on Sunday? You guys, you guys are all hung over on Sunday. So um, that would be a, a later afternoon talk. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like Kickstarter's 10 years old, so super awesome. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, ultimately, like, that was all of what was built up into what we were thinking about. Now, it wasn't about, like, disrupting those industries. It was about providing opportunity for all of these amazing creative people around us. And we realized there's got to be more than just our friends, right? Um, luckily, we were right. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, anybody, um, so this is a business school entrepreneurship program, I think. Um, anybody thinking of starting a business when they get out of here? Couple shy hands, okay. I bet you there's gonna be more, okay. Well, it is brutal, so I'll, I'll give you that. Um, hopefully it's less brutal uh, nowadays, but it is a brutal uh, endeavor. I think doing anything different is, um, is brutal, um, emotionally. Uh, and what I want to share with you today hopefully humbles that, that, that brutality a little bit and that story a little bit. Um, I think far too often we hear um, about the millions or billions or hundreds of millions of people that use the software that, that gets launched today, from the Twitter to the Instagram to the Facebook to, to whatever, um, or the hundreds of, of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars that gets raised on a Kickstarter campaign. Um, but that A isn't always the case and certainly wasn't always the case. Um, and so there's two stories, the next two chapters that I wanna share are mostly about humble beginnings and then where things can go, right? Um, and so I think the humblest of beginnings that one can um, go through uh, with respect to Kickstarter is literally the very first campaign that got funded on the, on the platform, which was called Drawing for Dollars by somebody named Dark Pony, which is awesome. I'm a huge proponent of um, the creativity around pseudonymity on the internet, um, sort of creating a character. You mentioned the Avengers, right? Like created characters, they all have like superhero names, like that's super awesome. Uh, and we can kind of be somebody else. So Dark Pony, man, woman, somewhere in between, don't know, don't care, but kind of awesome. Uh, the important thing about Drawing for Dollars, I would argue, is, is um, a couple things. One is it's play with a community. Um, the tension uh, with community as a positive thing, and, um, and honestly, like the innocence of it. It was like the perfect, one of the perfect projects. Um, so we launched April 28th of 2009. Uh, this was, pr I don't know, this was probably in early May that it got funded. Um, Dark Pony wanted to raise 
$15 to complete some drawings. I think they were $5 a pop, so you can do the math. That's three. Uh, three, drawings, uh, three drawings was uh, the minimum. And um, the, the story behind why Dark Pony created this project, which he or she shared on the campaign, was that that person was frustrated by the fact that they always doodled but never completed a drawing. And they, they felt that if they had a community of people that were paying them money, uh, that they had the social pressure, pride, uh, to deliver something finished, right? And so they were just using people, a community of people, to, f to finish a project, right? Um, it's almost like the community was the professor that said, you have a deadline, uh, you kind of took a look at things in reverse. Um, what was amazing about this, and we can only kind of look at this in, in retrospect, um, Dark Pony blew the doors off of his or her Campaign dollars, funding goal, raised $35. So the very first project raised $35 on Kickstarter from three people. Clearly somebody was generous, so super awesome. That speaks a lot volumes of what would come uh, with the future of Kickstarter, which is about generosity. Um, and this is, like again, perfect, perfect project. So a couple of months later, um, <clears throat> A couple months later, we, we had um, we'd seen projects obviously grow more than 35 bucks. They were like raising $800, maybe, maybe $1,500. A friend of mine who was trying to start a record label in Detroit um, uh, had said, hey, yeah, I need $1,500 to get a minimum order of, of these vinyl records pressed at United Pressings. Uh, and I was like, dude, you're crazy. Like, you're not gonna get $1,500. Like, no, I love you, but not gonna happen. Like, your network isn't that big. Um, sadly, um, probably my fault, he never launched a campaign, but that was kind of the status, was like $1,500, yeah, no, I'm a bad friend. Uh, that, was, that was kind of the status, $1,500, um, which is ironic, right, because I built this thing so I don't have to be a judge, right? Um, so, um, bad on me, I should apologize to Aaron. So, um, a couple months later, this woman, Allison, pops up. Um, and what was interesting about this time, Dark Pony, we didn't know who Dark Pony was, so first project, we didn't know who that was, but most of the campaigns at that time were people that we knew were us. My partners had run a campaign, I was running a campaign, uh, and along came this woman, Allison Weiss. A little bit about Allison Weiss that we came to discover. Uh, she was a graphic design student in Athens, Georgia, right? The internet's awesome, we can find out things about people, so she was a graphic design student, um, but on the weekends and at night, she was a singer-songwriter, so she would literally sit in her kitchen uh, with a little camera of some kind and record music, and then guess what theme here, share it on Tumblr. Um, so she launched her campaign, uh, I think she wanted to raise $2,000, um, and she had a 30-day um, timeline for her, her campaign. You guys all understand the mechanics of Kickstarter at this point, I, I don't have to explain that anymore, right? Fair? Okay, cool. You can ask me later and we'll explain it, but hopefully this all makes sense. So um, she had 30 days, she wanted to raise $2,000, and by that night she had raised $2,000. So like, whoa, what? You like just blew out the doors off of every campaign that we'd seen so far. Who is this person, like unknown musician? Uh, and um, we start doing our, our Spelunk and we realize she has a Tumblr, uh, basically a blog, where she's been sharing music for years, right? And so this is another lesson that we got taught. Oh, build an audience, right? Uh, so she was sharing her music all along. It's not like she just did an album on a whim. Uh, she'd been producing music for a while and she felt it was time for her to compile an album. And she'd written all this new music. And she had this embedded audience that in an instant came over to Kickstarter, right? She had this, this whole embedded audience and got her funded like that, right? She taught us something else that was really important. Anybody here back a Kickstarter campaign? Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so there's a term called stretch goals uh, that effectively, um, at least within Kickstarter parlance, um, was invented by Allison Weiss. Deeply creative person, uh, playful person. Her, the videos that she created are, are bloody awesome. They're super fun, very cute, uh, and engaging. And, um, and so she used this time that she had. She can't, you can't turn it off. So once you launch a campaign, you can't stop it until it strikes zero. It's just our, our thesis from a product standpoint. Um, so she couldn't stop it. She had to keep raising money, which is like, hello, a good thing. 
Uh, but she's like, all right, well, what's the next goal? Like, the first goal was just to get the album out there, right? Cool, so we got that. I can do the album. What else can I do for people? Um, and so she would start doing these little, like, playful stretch goals. If we achieve this goal, I'll do a little booklet, because I can afford a booklet now, right? The, price, the cost of things goes down um, as she has to produce more, more items. Um, and, uh, and there was this one moment which was kind of amazing. One of the, one of the um, rewards was that she would get on the, on the phone with you. Um, AKA Skype, whatever. Uh, so she would get on Skype with, with, with the person that put her over, I think it was like $6,000. Well, it just so happens that the person who put her over $6,000 um, was living in Australia. Uh, and she recorded this conversation, this Skype conversation, which was like super cute, but also super awkward, and then posted it, posted the video to project updates. So she engaged the community constantly and shared, and it was just this whole dialogue which was really beautiful. Um, but the two things out of Allison was, um, one, it, pr it, it was a moment where it's like, oh, this is working, like this, this can happen. Oh, embedded audience, like build an audience beforehand. Uh, and two, the stretch goal thing, like keep people entertained and engaged to think about how you, would, how you might, if you're, if you're lucky enough to hit your, like exceed your goal, how you can continue to draw people um, in a in a honest way uh, uh, to grow that goal um, to do more stuff. Um, so maybe the lesson in here, if there's any people who are thinking about business or eventually just going to frankly go out into the real world, uh, is uh, is thinking about how we learn from the things that we either manage or build. Right. All right. Anybody know this project? Raise of hands. Couple people. Okay. Cool. Um, so we talked about like the most innocent project on the platform, $35, although frankly there have been less people tried raising a dollar because you can, and that was the joke. Uh, cool. Uh, and, um, and so this is, this is a different story. This is sort of the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is about um, scale. This is about opportunity. Um, this is about community, right? Um, uh, this is a project called Pebble Time. There was a previous one um, that was called Pebble. So this is the second incarnation of Pebble. Uh, effectively what it was, and this is leading up to um, Apple launching the Apple Watch. This is well before that. Uh, and um, this is a guy by the name of Eric Magowski, who is a technologist and entrepreneur out in, uh, in California, built this little team to build this e-ink watch. So if you think about the um, Amazon Kindle e-ink, um, this was that turned into a watch, connected watch, um, all the things, right? And uh, uh, he had gone around Silicon Valley trying to get investors to um, support him. Guess what? No, uh, nobody's going to buy an e-ink watch. We're wait all waiting for Apple. When Apple comes out with the watch, like you guys will be decimated. No, no way possible. Eric and team uh, discovered Kickstarter uh, and said, well, I don't know. Let's just try that. Right, and so they put the put the uh, the project up on Kickstarter, effectively just to raise a enough money for a prototype. They just needed to get the thing made to prove that they can make this thing that they were promising. Um, let's call it ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. This campaign, similarly innocent, although they had the first one behind it, um, the first one raised half as much as the second, um, and I'm going to reveal how much the second raised, and you can do the math on the first. So they raised $20 million. So from $35 to $20 million, and prior to that, about a year and a half before they raised 10. Crazy. Crazy, right? I mean, the day that we hit uh, the uh, funding of a project that, that, that raised a million dollars, there was actually two projects. We called it Double Rainbow Day. Uh, and it was two projects that hit a million dollars on the same day. It was crazy. Like The fact that this is possible is insane. Um, nobody's yet to beat that, 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 uh, that funding goal. Maybe one of you gets to beat that funding goal someday with some amazing imaginative idea of your own. Um, but this is consistent. Like We have a number of multi-million dollar campaigns that get funded every year from, and again, across discipline, from film to music to product design uh, and so forth. Um, so we see small, we see large. I want to kind of get back to something that's um, a little bit more um, communal and maybe goes back to that narrative about this future, this unknown future. Um, so this is a, a project that's um, dear to me. I didn't back it. I found it afterwards. Um, but it speaks to the next generation. right? So these are high school and middle school kids. Um, 
maybe slightly younger than you guys. Uh, uh, and um, what they wanted to build, if you can see, can you guys make out what this kid in the, in the middle is, is sitting in? It's a, a little two-seater Cessna, right? A little airplane. Um, and they wanted to convert this airplane into a flight simulator. Like, what, what were you guys doing in high school? <laughs> For real, like, right? Like, not that. Uh, I certainly was, and I was doing other things that I'm not gonna talk about. Uh, and, uh, and so, like, what's amazing about this is there are these, like, tenacious, bold, creative, technically driven kids, I mean, literally kids, kids, babies, who are like, yeah, we're just gonna build a flight simulator. And if you watch the film, the, the, the little, uh, the pitch video, this kid in the, in the middle, um, scary smart, scary driven. You can just see it, I don't know if you can see it here, but, like, his eyes, like when you watch him talk about what he's doing, his whole responsibility was the HUD, the heads up display, so that he's a designer, so maybe I'm attracted to him, but he's just talking about with like such intensity, he's like, he's gonna do this, right? Like, forget you guys, he's just gonna do this, right? Uh, and they're all like that, I'm like, oh my God, like what are these guys gonna do? Uh, and, and so like there's this intensity, this drive, this passion, right? But I think the real story behind this project, and frankly, the the story behind the platform comes from just a really innocent comment. So this is this was early on in, in the platform's history, or pretty early on. Uh, and um, you know, as a founder, as a product designer, I am uh, obsessed with um, every little experiment we put out there. Kickstarter was a social experiment. Twitter, a social experiment. Facebook, a social experiment. Um, you could argue Ford was a social experiment. These are all experiments. We don't know if they're going to work, but eventually they work. Um, and so in this moment, you know, we're obsessing about all these projects. I am just like devouring what are people funding for? How are people funding it? What's the reaction from the community? Good, bad, ugly, everything in between. Um, and there's this comment uh, on the project by somebody who backed the campaign. Uh, it turns out she was a mother of two uh, and she want, for whatever reason wanted to express why she was backing this campaign, right? And uh, she said, I have two kids of my own, and I, and I'm, and I hope that some, someday somebody sees in my kids what I see in these, these five kids, right? And decides to support them the way I'm supporting these kids, right? And it hit me in that moment, which I think goes back to Dark Pony and drawing for dollars, and, and frankly, this whole like drive it gave me a different definition of what we had built, right? What we had built was a platform that provided the ability for me to fund you, right? Provide conduit, we provided conduit for you to exchange capital with somebody. But it wasn't about the money, right? Like we get so distorted by the $20 million. Like I saw you guys kind of like, whoa, right? And it's like, yeah, that's pretty impressive, that's amazing, that's spectacular. But the the biggest thing about all of this is, I think more importantly, what she was expressing was love, right? Was faith, was pride, was enthusiasm. And, and maybe in some cases it's like, I believe in you and I'm living vicariously through you as a creative person who has got the tenacity to put themselves out there, right? All of these emotions are kind of built into anybody supporting one campaign. Um, and that struck me uh, in a way that I'd not seen before, but I think is really important. And I think, to me, what I hope for this future that we're sort of stumbling into, quite frankly, or racing into, depending on who you are, um, is one that connects us more than it divides us, right? And allows us to almost get back to, um, this is gonna be an Obama reference, I'm sorry, but uh, gets back to Main Street economics, and I truly do believe this, which is, it's about, helping your neighbor out. And that neighbor literally might be on the other side of the world. Doesn't look like you, doesn't sound like you, but something, there's some connection, right? Whether it's artistic uh, or technological, whatever the thing is, cultural, um, there's something that, that connects you. Um, so, uh, I wanna go back and revise some of the numbers we shared. Clearly, um, I need to update that. Um, so, we've done pretty well. Uh, over that 10 years, and I think the number's actually different. We're getting maybe closer to five billion pretty soon, um, so super crazy, but uh, we see, we've see we we've distributed four billion dollars to all these different projects around the world, um, which is incredibly humbling. 160,000 
people who've created these projects uh, from 15 million people around the world supporting, supporting these people. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing, right? And so I think this goes back to that kind of ma Main Street e economics thing. Instead of being like Main Street South Bend, it's like Main Street World, right? Uh, and pick your discipline. If you're really into design or you're really into, um, no, where's that microphone? Where's the microphone we're gonna throw around? Oh, okay, well apparently that was funded on Kickstarter, so like weird full circle thing. Uh, maybe you're like really interested in, 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 uh, in microphones and, and, uh, and events, uh, and, uh, and, and that's your community, like audio engineers or something to that effect, and you're geeking out on that, and that's the thing that connects you, that's your main street, right? Um, so, so now I wanna talk about um, a new chapter, kinda goes back to humble beginnings again. Um, and uh, so at the end of 2013, just the very tail end of 2013, I had made this kind of ridiculous decision to leave the company. Uh, my father thought I was nuts. Um, his words, he thought I'd be a leper. Uh, and um, we can unpack what that means later. Um, and uh, and I, I, I left because I felt like there was still more to be done in, uh, in supporting um, ambitious, creative people that were putting themselves out there, right? Um, and it was still a struggle. It kind of goes back to that comment that like starting a company is brutal. Um, starting anything new is brutal. Start, starting anything that's kind of antithetical to the status quo is, is, is pretty tough. Um, and I wanted to empower more people. Um, and so um, thinking about that, anybody know the story of Sisyphus, right? Okay, yep, Tumblr again, awesome. Like, okay, first of all, like, let's just take pause. Like somebody took Legos, right, and made this bloody thing. Why? Just because, because people are awesome and they can share it on the internet and now I can use it in a slide. Um, so super awesome. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's this story of Sisyphus that I think is, is um, you know, as I get into my 40s, I realize like this is the thing that I've been trying to do my whole life is um, trying to make that rock a little bit lighter so that maybe, just maybe, Sisyphus can get that rock up the hill for it not to fall down. So that's the story of Sisyphus, right? Um, sort of the insanity. And, and so as you dig into the creative journey for people or dig into the creative process, I realized a couple of things. Um, and that was, boop, 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 boop. okay, cool. Uh, that access to equipment, right? So think about you guys in this university. It's an amazing engineering school and architecture school amongst other things, but you have access, I'm sure, to some outstanding equipment. Right, Purdue, we had the same thing, some incredible CNC stuff, some, some, some shops. The moment that you um, get kicked out, drop out, or graduate, wherever category you fit into, joke. <laughs> you guys are all gonna graduate, it's cool. Uh, and so the moment you leave school, like you lose your subscription, you can't come back and use those labs. And so like, what do you do? You've been trained by these amazing teachers and using these amazing tools to make some amazing stuff. You have all these things in your head and then you get a job, and you do other people's things. And I thought that was so unfair, right? So unfair. And, uh, and I think um, as a creative person around creative people, whether you're an engineer, or designer, or artist, what have you, um, <clears throat> I was fascinated by um, the lack of access to equipment, frankly, as we, as we um, repopulate cities. What is the result of repopulating cities and then becoming more dense? More expensive, right? So there's a fight for space, right? Um, and so not only is it cost uh, prohibitive to get access to equipment, um, it's caught, it becomes harder and harder to um, get access to space, to use that equipment, to make the things that, that are in our head, like uh, Lego Sisyphus things. Uh, and, um, and ultimately, we're all disconnected. Like, you are a community right now in school, right? You're a community of people, you're all, you're all neighbors, right? And you all get dispersed when you leave. And you find new communities for sure, um, but, <clears throat> but we're all very, very, very disconnected. And so how do we create community again around creative practice, right? Kickstarter was, was in part part of that, that Sisyphus story. Kickstarter was effectively um, connecting community uh, to creativity through capital. Uh, and now I wanted to kind of explore a different domain. So I had um, done what any um, designer, entrepreneur, technologist does. They build a prototype, right? Something that looks kind of 
fugly, uh, but kind of works. Um, and so I took over this little space um, in Chicago where I live, a little 4,000 square foot windowless space for a month, and put a bunch of tools in it, uh, invited a couple of my friends to, to utilize it and see like, I don't know, what's gonna happen, right? So some amazing stuff happens, uh, and that inspires me to do another experiment, right? Uh, what I would say is, is the, pro the actual prototype, which was a much bigger space, I was gonna do it for a year. Um, the first space was really to test its cultural desires. Charles just sort of cycling in his head where he, he sees the importance of cross-disciplinary sharing of knowledge, right? Can an architect sit next to a, a software engineer, sit next to a designer, sit next to a poet, sit, sit next to uh, an MBA student? And what does that like cesspool look like? How do they all inform each other and share and then either collaborate or just go in their merry way and, and create their own things? Um, but that was about community and cross-disciplinary community around tools and making. Uh, and that was amazing. We did it for a year. The first version was just test testing culturally. The second test was really around economics. Like, is there, okay, cool. So like there's, there's desire, now is there a business? Will people pay for this access? And how does that, how does that look like? Um, so it was this amazing year where people created civic art projects, which is that like weird LED thing that you see in the background, uh, to uh, board games, which were not really board games, but devices, it's the, where are you? Uh, this this uh, this project over here, which is a little game piece that you kind of use the city of Chicago as your game board, um, and kind of ran around the city solving solving puzzles to like literal board games, which ended up getting funded on Kickstarter, like this one, to um, a uh, an oven, uh, which you see this husband and wife team in the corner um, prototyping, right? So all this like whole diverse set of of projects coming out of it. Um, but I think as any entrepreneur, any designer, any technologist, you also have to take stock of what you're building and not hold those things too dear because it may not be the answer. Um, what was interesting is I had this really good, solid business on my hands. Um, shut it down, kind of reflected, um, did all the things that you guys are probably frankly better at, better at than I am, which was you know do your projections and get it all making love to um, Excel. I use Google Docs, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, and I realized like it wasn't hitting home enough, right? Now what's interesting, one might ask like, oh, here's this software guy that's getting into like brick and mortar retail stuff. Is retail falling apart? Um, and um, I kind of ran away from technology for a little while. I want to kind of divorce myself from, from that world for a little bit. But, um, but, in, but I knew I'd always get back. I just didn't know I would get back that quickly. And what I realized, I think that moment of realization for me and that sort of humble, stressful beginning of like, how am I gonna make this work? How do I make this bigger? How can I make this more impactful? Um, was this realization that it needs to be software. It needs to be on the internet. It needs to touch more people. Um, you might ask, how do you translate a CNC machine, right, uh, that's gonna let me or you make something physical to software? And I'm not gonna tell you, because I'm not there yet. Uh, we're still in stealth mode. Um, but it's this challenging question of um, what is your bigger goal, right? And how do you constantly kind of step back from the object that you made to say, how can this be better? How can this be bigger? How can this be more sustainable as a, as a business, but also uh, Im impact and empower more and more people? Um, and so that was the thought process. We'll see where that goes. Um, and what I mean by we'll see where that goes is everything's a big experiment, right? Um, there's all these like accolades that I and my co-founders got from Kickstarter, um, but that doesn't mean that we got the recipe, right? Like that was from work 10 years ago. We're in a totally different era right now. Um, and my new endeavor called Lost Arts, I don't know, it may or may not succeed. I certainly hope it succeeds um, for my own sake, for everyone's sake that it touches, um, but it may not work, right? There's the risk that it may not work. But there's also the risk, I would argue, um, for anyone who is thinking of anything independent, there's a much bigger risk, which is not even trying, right? Like we have all, we all, all have one life. You know, depending on your religion or your point of view, you might think otherwise, but at least for the moment, right, you're here. And you have one of here. And what do you do with that moment here, right? How do you push yourself to your own limits and understand who you are and what you want to be? 
Um, and I think you only do that by trying and attempting something that's outside of the vein of the norm, right? What's that kooky little weird idea that's in the back of your head that your parents, like, God damn, they have no idea what you're talking about, right? Um, I can recount when I was trying to explain to my father, uh, yeah, like, people are going to give money on the internet. Like, what? Like, the internet? Like, what? Like, don't worry, Dad. Like, it'll, I, I think it'll be a thing. Uh, right. I think it'll be a thing. Um, but you have to just try, right, for your own sake, if n nothing else, right? And mo more often than not, the people around you are not the people that you're actually looking to support day one, right? Um, you'll find somebody out in the world that, that is interested and thinks in the same way that, that you do. Um, some examples of that. So this is like the, uh, this moment of change that we're kind of stuck in in the world. Um, but maybe the lens that I want to I kind of share with you is this um, cross-disciplinary lens, maybe this disruptive lens, this way that we look at the world in a different way. Um, so any, any cyclists in the room? A couple? Oh, cool. Awesome. So I'm a cyclist. Um, I don't know why I live in the Midwest because, frankly, it's really flat here. I really miss mountains, but... Um, but I love Midwest. Uh, so I'm a cyclist. This is a cycling brand called Rafa out of the UK. Uh, uh, anybody know the term D2C, direct to consumer, aka using the internet just to connect to your, con connect to your customers directly? Um, so they started out as an internet retailer um, selling what I describe as sexy clothes to cyclists, aka Lycra. Um, it's a joke. Cool. Uh, a couple of people got it. Uh, and uh, at some point, uh, around 2011, 2012, um, they started to experiment with um, what is the value of retail? Like, should we open a physical store? It's fairly expensive clothing. We're selling on the internet. We see, because of where people are asking us to ship stuff to, where there are um, confluences of people. Um, I think, I'm, I'm not totally sure on this, I think their first pop-up was in New York. Let's just say it was in New York. Uh, I was living in New York, I stopped by, I knew Rafa at the time, and um, they just did a pop-up, a little test. Kind of goes back to that lost arts prototype, proof of concept story. Just a pop-up, didn't cost them a ton of money, um, they didn't have to get into a five-year lease and all this like painful stuff. Uh, they took over just sort of an empty retail space um, and brought community together. It worked. Worked so well that they started rolling out more of these things, running other pop-ups in other cities, bringing their community of people together. You could argue it was a marketing thing, it was a community thing. Um, now, this is a photograph of a permanent store in Chicago, so now they have one in Chicago. They have them all over the world, they're clubhouses. And um, that's not the important part of the story. The important part of the story to me is, well, maybe there's one of that, which is experimentation and, and then reflection. Is this valuable? We can shut it down, we can keep it running. Um, we don't have to commit to it. Uh, if it doesn't work. Um, but the other part is even in the design of the space. So they did something that is very antithetical to retail. Retail, when you walk into a store, there's a, there's a sign. Anybody know what the sign says? No, what, no food and drink. Yeah, no food and drink. That's true. That is true. They did, they did the opposite of that, too. Uh, no loitering. No hanging out. Can't hang out, right? Come in, buy, get out of here, right? Um, on any given day of the week, you might find me sitting, I don't know if you can see it, over right by the, the yellow triangle uh, in, this, in this gray couch. Loitering. I got my laptop open, I'm working. Behind me, coffee shop, right? So they allow you to come in, have coffee, they sell beer, they have pastries, um, and hang out. Like there's a whole row of hang out, co work if you want, right? Uh, and so the world's changing. Like this is a a confluence of of different mindsets where they were kind of breaking the rules of traditional retail and saying like, "Yo, we actually want you to be here, right? It looks good if there are people in the store, right? Uh, and we want to connect the the great power here. This might be my lens. I don't know if they see it this way. I believe they see it this way. The great power that our company is going to have is by connecting our customers together." Right? And that actually goes so far as to say that they have an app, it's on my phone, they have an app which allows me to orchestrate a bike ride and then find other cyclists uh, in, in the city of Chicago or wherever I am. And so it's really about community. Whole new way to think about um, clothing companies and retail. Um, we all know Airbnb. Uh, this is apparently an Airbnb. Um, and the question is, like, is this a hotel or is this a home? And to me, the answer is yes. It's both of those things. 
Clearly somebody lives here. I wish it was me, because that is amazing. Uh, who was the architect? Like, are you kidding me? That is so cool. Uh, so amazing place to live, but they, they lease it out to people. Like this is literally an image I just pulled from, from Airbnb's website. You could literally stay here. I'm sure it's fairly expensive, um, but what an experience that must be, right? Um, and, uh, and so like the tables are kind of turning. It's getting really mushy, really weird. Um, let's give another example. Um, this is a company called Ultimaker. It's another one of the many 3D printing manufacturers like MakerBot or Formlabs. Um, and the question here, I mean, this is sort of a random Google image search. Um, but you see this like slick looking guy in the background with his like fancy sport coat. Um, and the question to me is like, is this a executive's office? Is this a design studio? Is it a factory? Is it a prototyping lab? I bet this isn't what the prototyping labs at Notre Dame look like, right? They probably look a little bit more industrial, maybe. Uh, and so what's interesting is like that, that definition is changing too. Like our prototyping labs are actually our desks, right? Um, and we're just at the very beginnings of this future. There's so much about like 3D printing that just reminds me of like early computers and dot matrix printers and that crappy fidelity, um, which was super. Anybody remember dot matrix printers? Like nee, nee, right, right, or right. Uh, kind of reminds me of that. So early beginnings, little experiments, the race to kind of bring our, our product to market. Uh, and, and so like, let's continue that story. Like clearly this is more about Kickstarter, but this is about funding. Um, and this is about funding through the lens of community. So we're changing the form and the, and, and the process to, uh, to fund these things. Uh, and what's interesting actually about, about this project is, as I'm talking to students, um, this was a, a, there was a, there's a film about this actually. There was a, there was a race between MakerBot and Formlabs and, and maybe Ultimaker, maybe, maybe somebody else. Uh, and um, this came out of MIT. So this was a bunch of students from MIT Media Lab that were, had a different opinion about 3D printing. It's a pr procedural opinion uh, in terms of how, how you um, produce 3D printed objects. Uh, and, and that, again, kind of speaks to this experimentation, right? Um, we are all gunning for the same thing, but how we uh, articulate that into a product might be slightly different. Clearly, they kind of knocked that out of the park, nearly $3 million, super cool. And they just wanted to raise $100,000, right? right? Which is just to get a proof of concept out in, into, the, into the world. Um, so this one's super gross, uh, apologies. Um, but um, so this is the future of surgery. So this is somebody's esophagus. Uh, and uh, the, the backstory here, I was at a conference and, and met the guy who, who started this, um, and he told sort of the backstory of, of how he came to do this. So he was, in, he was a video game developer. He was in uh, the video game industry for a number of years, creating some pretty epic video games. And um, his parents, his, he's got a family history of doctors, right? And so they all sort of like, what are you doing with your life? You're creating video games. We're all doctors saving people. Um, which is, you know, that could be a challenging conversation. Uh, and so he was, he was guilted into um, taking his skills. Now, not guilted. He sort of saw this path into taking his skills as a video game developer and creating a much better application for um, virtual surgeries, right? Uh, and so, you know, the state of sort of technology for um, sort of surgical uh, um, simulation uh, is, is pretty poor um, at best. Uh, and so this was a guy who came to it from game theory, came to it from the fidelity of video games. Anybody play video games in here? Like, super awesome, right? Yeah, there you go. Uh, and created this, the most amazing video game. Think about the physics involved. I mean, there, these were, you know, think about video games. These are artists that are applying themselves through technology, right? And creating a consumer product. Uh, and so these are now these same guys with that artistry, that care, that finesse in terms of the physics uh, that we see in video games and applying it into um, surgery. And by the way, you can download this. Oh, clearly it's up here uh, on your iPhone, right? Uh, so that gets into who's a doctor now, right? We're all, we can all actually, we can do home surgery now, right? Like super cool, like uh, super gross. I don't even know where to go with that. Um, <clears throat> so last one, you know, we all know YouTube. Anybody know Stack Overflow? Anybody familiar with Stack Overflow? A couple of people. Um, so what was interesting, I was, I was um, putting this together. I was thinking like, you know, I'm going through and building software again. Um, and I'm not the world's best developer. I'm a pretty horrible developer, frankly. Um, I know enough just to be dangerous. Uh, and, but it, I, I'm super rusty. It had been a while since uh, I'd committed any code, probably about, <laughs> frankly, 10 years. 
Uh, and, um, and so I needed to kind of brush up again. And there's all these new tools out there, right? Like people are sharing their knowledge on YouTube, right? People are sharing their knowledge on Stack Overflow, literally built just for that, right? Uh, you can suck down people's code on, on GitHub or check it out, whatever, uh, and, and just learn through looking, observation. And it takes me back to 1993 uh, when some generous person out on the internet uh, had built this website called, uh, this is the worst, one of the worst URLs ever, barebones.html.com. Like, dude, you were early on the internet. Couldn't it have just been html.com? slash index.html, that would have been so awesome. Anyway, uh, barebones.html.com. That is how this person shared their knowledge around HTML, and that's how I got my start in my career, right? And so we're like back to square one. And all, there's all this information out there, all this, like this is the future of education. Sorry, Notre Dame. Uh, but this is the future of education, right? Now, it's not to say that we're kind of completely divorced. We, we still need this. We still need physical space. We still need context. Um, but how does this factor into it, right? Um, and I can just sit at home and like learn to code again. I can sit at home. Let's go back one, two. Boop. Come on, go back. This is gross. I can sit at home and learn to be a doctor, right? Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, actually, I would challenge you guys on that, kind of. Uh, so what's interesting is the future is very different and, and, and it argue, arguably um, requires us to kind of intermix disciplines, intermix ideas, and just try. All right. So um, since leaving Kickstarter and maybe because of Kickstarter, I get pulled into conversations um, all the time about like what's the future and disruption and all these conversations. And um, many of them are in like corporate settings, big companies trying to understand how they're going to navigate them, their way through the next challenge. And um, you know, I start telling this story of like, like punk rock kid, Kickstarter, disruptor, all this stuff. And it's, uh, it, not only is it slightly offensive to me, but it's also um, a tough pill for them to swallow. This moment on one end, with all of this upheaval and change uh, through the, uh, the access and opportunity with technology, um, scares people, right? And so this statement scares people. Who does it scare? It scares the incumbents, the people who are trying to protect themselves from a future that they don't, they don't see yet. We don't see yet. Um, and so as I was getting older, because we do that, uh, as I was getting older, I was realizing like, well, maybe there's a different way to kind of approach this that feels more empowering to those who are um, feeling change to then maybe get them to act on that change, be creative again. Um, and so there's a softer way. Like you'd say that maybe this is about me getting older and having kids and like them beating me down. My kids are exhausting, um, but I love them. Uh, and there's just a different twist on this statement, which I think um, becomes a little bit friendlier that it was interesting to me. And I'll share that with you now, uh, which is that the rules were always temporary, right? The differences were also connected now. Twitter, Facebook, the internet, Usenet groups, whatever, whatever your flavor of the internet is, we're also connected, right? I can have a conversation with somebody in Saudi Arabia, in Moscow, in China, and down the street, right? Uh, and we're all connected, so information just goes like that, like nothing, right? And, and so in, in the days of uh, uh, horse and buggy, information traveled much slower, and so change happened much slower. But because of the pervasive access to, to information and one another, information travels so much faster, so that ideas can traverse and change and products, I mean, look, uh, I was just listening to a podcast. Um, anybody remember Friendster? A couple, yeah, right? So I was just li listening to an interview with uh, the founder of, of Friendster. And uh, you got to think, Friendster, MySpace, uh, High Five, uh, and now Facebook, right? Somewhat, like, is there, is there, what's the next thing, right? And so, like, A, there's always opportunity for us to invent something new because there's always change afoot. Like, you guys are all living in a super special moment, and I would argue we're just in the very, very beginnings. Feels like we're at the end. We're just at the beginning, I guarantee it. So thank you very much. Um,
hopefully you guys have questions, because I got time. Hi, so one of the um, first times I heard about Kickstarter was actually when uh, South Park covered in one of their episodes. Oh my God. And so yeah. I know like in the past when they cover uh, different topics um, yeah. or companies, people either have positive or negative reactions to it. Yeah. What so I was wondering what was the reaction to it? And also did you guys see like an increase in site traffic or projects being started? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so first I'll say like that was super awesome. Like come on, we're on South Park. The creepy thing is, um, so at that time, so when we started out, first when we started out, we were distributed all over, this, all over the country. I was living in Chicago, my two co-founders were in New York, and our developers were scattered around the country. Um, and then we coalesced around New York, so we, I moved to New York. And we had this crappy little office in the Lower East Side. Anybody been in New York? Anybody, oh wow, oh, okay. Anybody been in the Lower East Side in the uh, 90s? In the two, or it's a different Lower East Side right now. Uh, well, we weren't around in the 90s, but whatever. Anyway, it's like Lower East Side's an interesting part of New York. Um, it's super awesome, very punk rock. Uh, and uh, so we're in this like crummy little, um, I can use other words, uh, apartment building. Um, literally, if I can picture it for you, like you open the door and the, the stairs going up, uh, we're literally on a slant over. You, you're, it's creaking, you're going like, what the hell's going on? And there's this total dive bar underneath. Um, anyway, uh, when that South Park episode came out, we were in the process of moving to a bright, shiny office across the river in Brooklyn, right? Um, we had bought this building. We completely gutted it. Uh, it's a beautiful space. Um, and somehow, they captured that new office. We hadn't even moved in yet. And it, so that part was creepy. <laughs> Um, now, there were architectural renderings or whatever uh, on the internet, but clearly somebody had done their homework on South Park and maybe got a little obsessive about Kickstarter. But, but the, so that was a, maybe a pride and a creepiness thing. Uh, but that was super awesome. I, I actually, I, I love it. Um, did we get any uh, uh, lift from it? Um, actually don't, I actually don't know. Um, technically, I don't know. But I will say what was interesting about um, that moment, or I, what I would say is like moments of pub publicity in the mainstream, um, and South Park's kind of a, is it mainstream? Like, kind of, but it's pretty edgy, right? Like, um, but when, you know, when we're on the Today Show or something like that, um, there is a spike, uh, but the projects are kind of not so good. Uh, and so you really have to think about Kickstarter as a, as a um, community of projects that are on the fringe. So as, and I think that maybe might get into a, a conversation around, um, press around the thing that you've built and thinking about where, where is your market and how, did that, how does that align with the press that you're getting? Um, and then so how do you kind of manage press? It's probably not at all the question you're, you're interested or answer you're interested in, but there you go. Questions, Bueller, somebody. <laughs> Uh, what do you think is the most effective way of managing like the, the bad perception from the, the few instances of fraud on uh, crowdfunding sites like, like Kickstarter? Can you, say, can you say that again? Uh, what do you think are the, the best practices uh, for addressing uh, kind of the, the bad press uh, and, and helping people uh, still see the, the good that can come out of Kickstarter when there are instances of, of fraud, even if they are a very, very small number yep. of cases? Uh, is that a question about um, Kickstart, like the company managing that, or the person running the project managing that? I think more the uh, the company managing the company. It. Um, so, a, it's a tricky topic. Um, this, so, the question was around um, the perception of fraud. And I say perception because um, we, we we wrote a blog post about this, um, which was uh, about lateness. Um, and so think about the context of anybody running a campaign. It's generally speaking the first time they've done something like that. Uh, and, uh, and the thing isn't made yet, generally speaking. Not in all cases, but generally it's not made. Uh, and so there's this whole journey that they have to go through. Um, and if anyone here has made anything, uh, generally everything takes longer than you hope, right? Uh, and the pressure, I think, that some people are kind of under in their own head is like, oh, I gotta say I'm gonna get this to them really quickly. 
right? Because that might be some perception of like they want to back it, right? Because they want to get it, um, which I would argue is probably not so much the case. Um, and uh, and so this narrative of lateness is interesting in that. Um, so think about your Apple, your your iPhone, right? Now you can pre-order your iPhone, right? Um, a week or maybe a couple months in advance of it coming. Uh, Apple has gotten that down to a science where that thing is on the ship from Foxconn. Like it's coming from China. It's 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 showing up. Like you're not. It, 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 at worst, it's a day late, right? Um, but they have got that down mechanically. Um, and so their pre-order versus, say, if you want to think about Kickstarter as a pre-order, worlds apart, worlds apart, right? Supply chain isn't really set up, especially if you think about Pebble, where they were wanting to raise like ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and suddenly like, uh, what? Like the little place that was going to manufacture the thing, like, oh my god, they can't take me anymore, and now my timeline's all blown out because now I got to start over and find, like, who do I go to? Who, do I, who goes and makes that many things? Uh, and so, like, when you bring up this topic of fraud, and I say perception, a lot of times things are late, but it's because those people are buried in things that they didn't really um, think about. And so, a lot of times, these are like false accusations. Um, and then I think there's, um, you know, there, there's, there's always going to be um, instances. The question is, fraud assumes that it's a bad player. Um, I'll tell two stories. Um, so there's a project called the Invisible Speaker, uh, which is a speaker. Uh, made out of steel and glass, right? Uh, meaning the encasement is. Uh, <clears throat> and it was beautiful. I backed it. A bunch of people backed it. Uh, the project creators, um, we come to find out later, had some manufacturing troubles. They were really quiet. They didn't say anything. Um, and so what do some people in the backer community start? Pitchforks. Where, you're late. Where's the thing? You guys ran off with the money. Um, no, they were just scared, right? Uh, and eventually... Uh, they posted an update, revealed all of what was going on. Um, yeah, a couple people were still upset, but most people came back around, right? Um, and so I think this gets into this other topic around transparency, and I think the importance for us as a platform, as a company, uh, to impart the values of transparency in our project creators, which isn't innate. Like, we're not coming from a world that's, that's used to that necessarily, even with Facebook and Twitter, right? Um, and so I think I think there's like a multi like there's a multiple view that one needs to look at um, for this. Uh, the other story, what was the other story I was going to give? Oh, the other story I was going to give. Um, so this is actually a really interesting project from like OG days of Kickstarter. Uh, so <clears throat> there was this project called Locksport. Anybody want to guess what that project was? Anybody know what Locksport is? Nobody. Nobody. What's that? Where are you? Lock lock picks. Yep. Yep. Ooh, who are you? Uh, that, that, that. Uh, yeah, so, so what's interesting is, like, I didn't bloody know this. There is a, a, a whole underground community of people that do competitive lock picking. For real. It's like big in Germany, apparently. For real. Like, and I, I know it's big in New York, but it's big in, in different reasons. <laughs> uh, but, but lock picking, right? And, uh, and it's fast. It actually gets into whole, like, um, crypto and cryptography. It's, like, super fascinating. Um, and, uh, and so there's this guy who was fast, part of this community who was fascinated with locks, and he created this project called Locksport, uh, which gave you a lock picking kit, which we then come to find out is illegal in a few states. So that's interesting. Uh, you never know what you're going to make. Uh, so um, that was a new challenge, a whole other topic. But what was interesting was, um, so I, I met the guy who, who ran the campaign, super sweet guy. Um, and he's had a very tough life. Um, and he was going through and delivering the reward. So it successfully funded. It did pretty well. It wasn't like epic, but it did, did well, certainly for something that's like a lock picking kit. Uh, right? Thank you. Uh, and um, he was failing miserably. Right? And when I say failing miserably, I, I want to say like suicide. Right? Like he was like troubled. Um, and he was under all this pressure because he couldn't deliver. Turned out there was um, anybody familiar with a website called archive.org? The internet is awesome. It saves itself, generally speaking. Uh, so the guy who is uh, um, behind archive.org, uh, he had backed this project. And somehow he was connected uh, to the guy running a campaign and reached out to him. Turns out he found out that he was suicidal 
and having all these problems and came to the rescue and actually took over the campaign. You want to talk about community, right? Here's somebody who has no benefit in supporting this person. Actually, should have a pitchfork. Like, yo, where's my thing? Uh, this is a very long-winded story to your, your, your innocent question, which I think was a good question. Um, but on the surface, one might think fraud, right? But the reality is this person was going through such anguish because they couldn't deliver. They couldn't get over the hump. And what was interesting was this person came, took over the campaign, literally started writing messages as if they were the creator, well, as him, indicating that I'm taking over. Uh, and we'll, we can't get everyone's thing. We don't have enough money, but we'll do something, right? And if anyone's willing, I, I backed the project. I was like, hey, I don't need the lock pick. I was more just fascinated with the project. I don't need my lock pick. I'm not going to do that. Um, so some people gave up their lock picks, right? And so that's another form of community. Hey, I care more about this person's life than getting a bloody lockpick. Some people want their lockpicks and they deserved them. So um, it's, you know, the, the topic is really, uh, it's a difficult one and it's a muddy one um, and it's not as black and white as, you know, going into um, uh, Amazon and uh, ordering a book and you don't like the book, right? Because it's poorly written and it was hyped up or something like that feels like a different kind of fraud. So. Um, hopefully that kind of answers your question, which is also to say like the things that we make are like super complicated, right? Nuanced. So good question. Thank you. Oh, cool. Uh, yes. Um, could you, um, is there any data on which one, which projects have been the most successful projects from Kickstarter when you take in consideration the criteria? Was it, uh, where it, was it, some project that just pitched the idea and was very mm. basic, foggy, or number two was a project that was pretty much developed and they had paperwork and uh, patent pending or something, or, or three, they have their model and mm. a lot of paperwork and everything done, they just need the extra oomph, you know, which of those were the most uh, successful? Like, does that, meaning, does, is there a correlation between uh, one of those three models and success? Uh, yes. Right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, I would say the way you outlined it, uh, probably not. Um, remember, there's a bunch of different categories. And so, um, you know, as you talk about, like, words are important. These are important to me. And so things like prototype, right, uh, like, that speaks to product design. Doesn't quite speak as much to, say, film. Uh, or art, uh, and um, and so I think the the level of expectation that a backer might have to prove like is this am I going to actually get this thing is probably slightly slightly different per category. Um, there are things that we have done as a company to um, drive people more towards uh, the example that you gave around more preparedness, prove that you can do it. Right, uh, and product design, I think, is one of those categories that we're a little bit more um, forceful on for the the creator um, because there's a little different expectation, generally speaking, and they tend to be bigger projects from time to time. Um, which is, you know, talk about your uh, what what is your schedule like? You should supply a schedule that you're working around now. It might break, like that schedule might break, but at least you show that you're prepared. Um, with film, you know, I, I think in general, maybe less so of that. Like, you don't really show a prototype. But as a backer, regardless of the case, I want to see that you can pull off the thing. So anything that you can show is good for you uh, to show. Um, but I would say, like, you know, for the film, and, and there's different stories with film. It was just somebody else had recounted this to me the other day, which is um, some people go in with a film project, and it's like, hey, I've got the script. And I just need to hire. I need to hire the the uh, the camera person and the audio engineer. And like we need to actually do the film. Like we need to shoot it, uh, pay the actors and all of that. So some people fund for that. Uh, some people fund for um, post production. It's shot. We just need to do the finishing, like the editing and all that stuff, which can be expensive. Um, and sometimes it's like done. It's a package. And now we just need to distribute it. We need to go to Sundance and all the festivals. Um, I, I don't know if there's a corollary to say like product design. Um, I'm sure there's something similar to that. Like we've gotten, like, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the story of Scott Wilson, who's an industrial designer up in Chicago, runs a small studio called Minimal, M-N-M-L, 
so minimal, minimal. Uh, and um, he had run a campaign that was almost the first million dollar campaign. It raised $948,000 and some change. Uh, and what he had done was he showed examples of like, here's my sketches, like here's other things that we've made. He talked about the fact that he was um, global head of, uh, global creative director for the watch category uh, at Nike. So he's got a good resume, he's done it before. And so it's all, I think all of that is about um, building trust with your backers, like proving that you have the ability. It doesn't need to show that it's a sure thing. Um, you just need to show that you can accomplish it, you can persevere. I think that's it, yeah. One more. Hi there. Uh, just kind of a follow up on that too. So you mentioned Kickstarter kind of started because you're trying to buck away from the industrialization trend of people and creativity. Yep. Are you concerned at all that uh, crowdsourcing could get industrialized, whether that's kind of a perfect science for the perfect campaign that generates mm. maximum funding or people just building companies that only focus on certain categories? Um, we, when, when I'll use your term concern, concern from the sense of we focus on that, like we pay attention to it uh, in an effort to dismiss that, right, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll give you an example. I think there is, um, there are consultants out there that talk about how like they can, like you've got a project, you've got a campaign, um, you're looking for support, do I have to hire a consultant to you know, better my campaign, market the campaign? Um, you hire me to do that. I'm going to tell you that I can, I can, I can get you. We've done these other campaigns, five hundred thousand dollars and up, right? Um, now the question that you need to ask uh, is, did those projects raise five hundred thousand dollars or more, whatever it was, because of me, or because of the product, or to what degree did that person's effort, the consultant that marketed the campaign in a certain way? Um, what was the delta? No, no, nobody actually ever knows that, right? Um, it's, it's a hard thing to, to run, but I think that gets into the, um, maybe a little bit of the presumed industrialization around the platform. Um, I frankly don't ever see the platform turning into um, a industrial complex. And I say that because um, one way that I can describe Kickstarter is the, it's the marketplace for the unmarketable, right? It's all the people that got said, were said no before, right? Uh, and so this is like their, their uh, I'm gonna make a Star Wars reference, their only hope, right? Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, I think we, we, we think about that um, as three creative people and a staff that is epically creative. Uh, as an example of that, I think very few, if any, of our engineers studied computer science. They all studied literature or art or something other than computer science, but taught themselves computer science because they were interested in it. Uh, and so I think, um, I think for the foreseeable, I'm not so concerned. There's definitely a lot of, a lot of stuff going on within crowdfunding and, and so forth. But, um, and clearly people always want some assuredness that um, the thing I'm putting out is gonna make a lot of money. Um, but I think we all, always have to remind ourselves that you use Kickstarter just to get a leg up, right? Just to start, it's kind of in the name. So yeah, good question, yeah. Charles. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah.